cervical, thoracic, and lumbar spine anatomy and conditions. There are 26 bones in the spine. It is easy to remember the number of the bones within the sections of the spine as they are times we eat, 7, 12, and 5. There are 7 cervical vertebrae, 12 thoracic vertebrae, 5 lumbar vertebrae, the sacrum is comprised of 5 fused vertebrae, and the coccyx contains 4 fused vertebrae. The first two vertebrae are a little different than the others. C1 is known as the atlas. C2 is known as the axis and has the dens or a small projection which goes up inside of the body of the C1. A fracture of C1 is known as a Jefferson fracture. A Jefferson fracture is a bone fracture of the anterior and posterior arches of the C1 vertebrae, although it may also appear as a three or two part fracture. The fracture may be a result from an axial load on the back of the head or hyperextension of the neck. This causes a posterior break and may be accompanied by a break in other parts of the cervical spine as well. It is named after the British neurologist and neurosurgeon, Sir Geoffrey Jefferson, who reported four cases of the fracture in 1920 in addition to reviewing other cases that had been previously reported. The vertebrae have distinct features which separate the different levels. Cervical vertebrae have a small body. They allow for the major movements of rotation, flexion, and extension. Thoracic vertebrae have long transverse processes. They allow for the major movement of lateral flexion. The lumbar spine are the largest and the thickest, and they allow for the major movements of flexion and extension. The sacrum is the large triangular shaped bone with the base directed upward. It is comprised of five fused sacral vertebrae. The coccyx is a small irregular shaped bone. The coccyx encompasses four underdeveloped vertebrae. The spine is made up of small bones that are stacked along with discs on top of one another. The spine has a natural curve to it. A healthy spine, when viewed from the side, has gentle curves. The curves help the spine absorb stress from the body movement and gravity. When they're viewed from the back, the spine should run straight down the middle of the back. The cervical vertebrae and lumbar spine have a natural anterior convex curvature. The thoracic spine has a natural concave curvature when viewed from the side. When abnormalities of the spine occur, the natural curves of the spine are misaligned or exaggerated in certain areas, such as that occurs with lordosis, kyphosis, and scoliosis. An intervertebral disc lies between the adjacent vertebrae in the vertebral column. Each disc forms a fibrocartilaginous joint or a symphysis joint and allows slight movement of the vertebrae. It acts like a ligament to hold the vertebrae together. Their role as shock absorbers in the spine is crucial. Discs consist of an outer fibrous ring, the annulus fibrosis, which surrounds the inner gel-like center, which is called the nucleus proposis. The annulus fibrosis consists of several layers of laminae or fiber cartilage that are made up of both type 1 and type 2 collagen. Type 1 is concentrated towards the edge of the ring where it provides greater strength. The stiff laminae can withstand compressive forces. The fibrous intervertebral disc contains the nucleus propulsus, and this helps to distribute pressure evenly across the disc. This prevents the development of stress contractions in which could cause damage to the underlying vertebrae or their end plates. The nucleus propulsus contains loose fibers suspending in the microprotein gel. The nucleus of the disc acts as a shock absorber, absorbing the impact of the body's activities and keeping the two vertebrae separated. There are 23 discs in the human spine. Six are in the neck, 12 are in the middle, and five are in the lower back. There is one disc between each pair of vertebrae except for the first segment at the atlas. The atlas has a ring around it that's roughly cone-shaped in extension of the axis. The axis acts as a post around which the atlas can rotate, allowing the neck to swivel. The spinal cord is a long, thin, tubular bundle of nervous tissue and support cells which extend from the medulla oblongata in the brainstem to the lumbar region of the vertebral column. The brain and spinal cord together make up the central nervous system, or CNS. The spinal cord begins at the occipital bone and extends down to the space between the first and second lumbar vertebrae. It does not extend the entire length of the vertebral column. 
It is around 45 centimeters in men and around 43 centimeters long in women. Also, the spinal cord has a varying width ranging from 13 millimeters thick in the cervical and lumbar regions to 6.4 millimeters thick in the thoracic area. The enclosing bony vertebral column protects the relatively shorter spinal cord. The spinal cord functions primarily in the transmission of neuronal signals between the brain and the rest of the body, but can also contain neuronal circuits that can independently control numerous reflexes and central pattern generators. The spinal cord has three major functions, as a conduit for motor information, which travels down the spinal cord, as a conduit for sensory information in the reverse direction, and finally as a center for coordinating certain reflexes. The cauda equina, or Latin for horse's tail, is a bundle of spinal nerves and spinal nerve roots consisting of the second through fifth lumbar nerve pairs, the first through fifth sacral nerve pairs, and the coccygeal nerve, all of which arise from the lumbar enlargement and the clonus medullaris of the spinal cord. The nerves that compose the cauda equina innervate the pelvic organs and lower limbs to include motor innervation of the hips, knees, ankles, feet, internal anal sphincter, and external anal sphincter. Within the spine, there are 31 pairs of spinal nerve roots. Each spinal nerve root separates into the ventral root, or anterior root, and the dorsal root, or posterior root. The ventral root or anterior root is the efferent motor root of the spinal nerve. Efferent signals travel away from the central nervous system toward the peripheral effector organs, mainly muscles and glands. The dorsal root or posterior root emerges from the spinal cord. The dorsal root transmits sensory information forming the afferent sensory root of a spinal nerve. The afferent sensations arise from the nerve cell in the body and carry nerve impulses from the sensation receptors towards the central nervous system. In the nervous system, there is this closed looped system of sensation, decision, and reaction. This process is carried out through the activity of afferent neurons or sensory neurons, interneurons, and efferent neurons or motor neurons. The motions that are available in the spine are rotation, flexion, extension, and lateral flexion or side bending. Common mechanisms of injury for the spine are hyperextension, where the spine is forced backwards, hyperflexion, where the spine is forced forward, and axial loading, which is a sudden excessive compression which drives the weight of the body against the head. There are three main types of spinal curvature disorders, including kyphosis, which is characterized by an abnormally rounded upper back, more than 50 degrees of curvature, lordosis, also called swayback, the spine of the person with lordosis curves significantly inward at the low back. Lordosis can also occur at the head with an increase in the amount of lordosis. Cervical lordosis results from forward head posture. Scoliosis is a lateral curvature of the spine. I would encourage you to watch the quick video entitled Spinal Conditions Pop Quiz to see some additional examples of spinal abnormalities. Especially with scoliosis, the first treatment is usually bracing. The core is braced with hard plastic in the attempts to realign the spine and provide structural support. Unfortunately, if the amount of curvature is greater than 45 degrees, often the only option is a surgical intervention. It is common to fuse the spine to maintain the structural support. However, in fusing the spine, patients often lose mobility. Common cervical spine conditions include cervical fractures, cervical dislocations, cervical strains, cervical sprains, cervical spinal stenosis, and brachial plexus injuries. All will be discussed further. Cervical fractures are relatively uncommon, but when they occur, they may result in permanent damage. The most common mechanism of injury is either from an axial load or hyperflexion, which occurs frequently in gymnastics during tumbling and aerial routines, ice hockey when the head is flexed and then driven into the boards surrounding the ice when a player is checked, diving, especially if the water is too shallow for a dive, football or rugby with either axial loading or head flex tackling. Common signs and symptoms include neck point tenderness, cervical spasms and pain, chest pain, weakness or numbness in the extremities, loss of bowel or bladder control. Management of cervical fractures include stabilizing the fracture with a hard cervical collar, early spine boarding to maintain stabilization, and activation of EMS. 
Cervical dislocations are not common, thankfully, but happen more frequently than do fractures. The mechanism of injury is hyperflexion or rotation. Signs and symptoms are the same as those for fracture, as is the management. The x-ray on this slide is an example of a C5, C6 dislocation. We can see where the bones should be articulated, but they have slipped off of each other. Common fracture and dislocation management include substantial bracing. The picture on the left is of a hard cervical collar, which minimizes neck movement and allows tissue to heal. When a brace is not sufficient enough to reduce movement, a halo vest immobilizer may be used. Halo immobilizations are commonly used for unstable fractures. The cranial ring is secured to the patient's skull using four metal pins. The ring attached by four metal bars to a plastic vest and is worn continuously. The estimated reduction in all cervical motion is over 90%. Halo vest immobilizers provide distracting forces which can aid in stabilization and reducing the load of the head on the cervical spine. Cervical sprains are when the ligaments of the neck are damaged, frequently through a whiplash or sudden snap of the head. Signs and symptoms include pain, stiffness, and restriction in the range of motion. Management of cervical sprains include price, or protection, rest, ice, compression, and elevation, NSAIDs, or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, stretching and strengthening. Cervical strains occur when the muscles or tendons of the neck are damaged, frequently through the same mechanism as results in cervical sprains. The signs and symptoms may be very similar to sprains as well, but may also include muscle spasms, which may be easily palpated. We manage cervical strains the same way as we do cervical sprains. This picture illustrates the many cervical ligaments which could be injured during a sprain. It isn't important that you determine which particular ligament has been damaged as the treatment is pretty much the same for all sprains. You do not need to memorize all the ligaments, but it is important to understand how complex the spine is and how delicate it can be. Cervical spinal stenosis is the narrowing of the cervical canal in the neck. The spinal canal is the open area in the bones or vertebrae that make up the spinal column. The spinal cord is a collection of nerves that run through the spinal canal from the base of the brain to the lower back. When the spinal column narrows, the spinal cord may be pinched or impinged. Common signs and symptoms include transient quadriplegia, which means they have a paralysis of all four extremities that comes and goes, burning, tingling, numbness, weakness, and symptoms may disappear after 10 to 15 minutes. An MRI is often needed to determine the management for cervical spine stenosis. If spinal stenosis is discovered, an athlete may need to discontinue participation, especially if they are participating in a contact sport such as lacrosse, rugby, or American football. Brachial plexus injuries are often also called burners or stingers. The mechanism of injury is either a stretch or a compression of the nerve bundle. Signs and symptoms include burning, tingling, temporary pain, numbness, and sometimes weakness to the arm. They may describe that they have a quote-unquote dead arm. Repeated injuries can result in permanent neurological damage to the upper extremity. Management is removing the athlete from activity and rest. Thoracic spine conditions include thoracic contusions, sprains and strains, and thoracic spinal fractures. Thoracic contusions, sprains, and strains are rare. They are most commonly seen in car accidents from the chest hitting the steering wheel. If there are bruises on the thoracic cavity, it is imperative to also examine for internal organ injury as well. When ribs break, they can puncture the lungs or the heart, which may result in catastrophic injury. Signs and symptoms include ecchymosis, swelling, and decreased range of motion. The person may also complain of difficulty breathing. Management of thoracic contusions, strains, and sprains includes immediate referral. Thoracic fractures are rare, but can happen in high-impact sports such as skiing, tobogganing, skydiving, automobile racing, and rodeo. Wedge fractures are the most common types of fracture. A wedge fracture is a compressive fracture on the anterior surface of the vertebrae. The vertebrae then collapses anteriorly. If this fracture isn't bad enough, the spinous process may also open up, 
which results in a chance fracture. Common lumbar spine conditions that will be discussed are lumbar contusions, strains and sprains, lumbar fractures, spondylolysis, spondylolisthesis, facet joint dysfunction, disc pathology, sciatica, and SI joint dysfunction. Lumbar contusions, strains, and sprains are rare. Lumbar pain is very common. An estimated 75 to 80% of the population experiences low back pain resulting from mechanical injury to muscles, ligament, and connective tissue. Approximately 30% of children suffer from low back pain. Poor posture, including excessive lumbar lordosis curvature and weak abdominal muscles are frequently associated with low back pain. Some people refer to this as the butt out, gut out position, which is exhibited in the top picture. Signs and symptoms include ecchymosis, swelling, decrease in range of motion, and possible radiating pain, usually into the lower extremities. Management of lumbar contusions, strains, and sprains include controlling the pain and hemorrhage, and then stretching and strengthening of tissue. Lumbar fractures, like the thoracic fractures, are rare, but they can happen in contact sports, such as football, rugby, soccer, basketball, hockey, and lacrosse. Fractures often lead to other soft tissue injuries. The most common type of fracture in the lumbar spine is a compression fracture, and also what are known as spondees. A spondylolysis is a stress fracture of the pars interarticularis. They are common in adolescents and athletes that are still developing. The fracture of the pars interarticularis can either be bilateral on both sides or unilateral on only one side of the vertebrae. The most common mechanism of injury occurs as a result of repetitive hyperextension. This injury is known as a collared Scotty dog fracture, as it resembles a Scotty dog wearing a collar when the fracture is x-rayed, such as that in the picture. The signs and symptoms, which are common to a spondylolysis, are pain in the lumbar spine, possibly radiating into the buttocks and thighs, muscle spasm, pain with extension, and decreased flexion of the spine. Management includes x-ray to identify the fracture, possible bracing or bed rest, and eventually rehabilitation, focusing on core exercises with strengthening the abdominal muscles and the back. A spondylolisthesis is more severe version of a spondylolysis. This includes a bilateral pars interarticularis fracture. This injury may also include anterior displacement of the affected vertebrae. The signs and symptoms of a spondylolisthesis are the same as they are for a spondylolysis. However, this injury may also include a step-off deformity, which means when the spinous processes are palpated, one spine may be displaced anteriorly and it may feel like the finger slips into the spine. Conservative treatment is much the same as it is for a spondylolysis. The spondylolisthesis happens most frequently at the L5 level as it sits precariously on the sacrum. A hangman's fracture is a specific type of spondylolisthesis where the second cervical vertebrae or C2 is displaced anteriorly relative to the C3 vertebrae due to fractures of the C2's vertebral pedicles. Treatment for the spondies include conservative or non-surgical options like bracing, with pictures on the left given as examples. More invasive management may include surgical fixation and intervention. Facet joint dysfunction accounts for nearly 45% of all chronic low back pain. Facet joint dysfunction is a broad term but may include such maladies as facet joint syndrome or inflammation of the facet joints, arthritis or degeneration of the facet joints, or dislocation and subluxation of the facet joints, which might result in locking of the joint causing hypomobility or a decrease in mobility. Signs and symptoms of facet joint dysfunction include nonspecific low back, hip or buttock pain, flattening of the lumbar lordosis curve, Increased pain with rotation, extension, and lateral flexion towards the involved side. And management strategies should include X-ray or MRI to determine injury, anesthetic injection to the facet joint, rest, NSAIDs, and core strengthening exercises. 
A herniated disc occurs when the gel-like center of the disc ruptures through the weak area on the tough outer wall, similar to the filling being squeezed out of a jelly donut. Back or leg pain, numbness or tingling may result when the disc material touches or compresses the spinal nerve. Treatment with rest, pain medication, spinal injections, and physical therapy is the first step to recovery. Most people improve in approximately six weeks and return to normal activity. If symptoms continue, surgery may be recommended. There are four different levels of disc herniation. A protrusion or bulging occurs when some eccentric accumulation of the nucleus with slight deformity of the annulus. A prolapse is when the nucleus moves through the annulus. An extrusion occurs when the nucleus moves into the spinal cord. And during sequestration, the nucleus separates from the disc itself. Disc herniation is the most common at the L4, L5 level. Disc pathology signs and symptoms include sensory and motor deficits, alteration in tendon reflex, sharp pain that shoots down to the lower extremity, muscle spasm, and increased pain with coughing and sneezing. Conservative management includes price and rehabilitation as the first course of treatment. If that is ineffective, then possibly surgery is warranted. Sciatica is the general term for all low back pain. The sciatic nerve is the largest nerve in the body. Sciatica results from irritation to the sciatic nerve. It can also be from a herniated disc, spinal stenosis, possibly piriformis syndrome, or may be due to other causes. Piriformis syndrome is an uncommon neuromuscular disorder that is caused when the piriformis muscle compresses the sciatic nerve. The piriformis muscle is a flat band-like muscle located in the buttocks near the top of the hip joint. This muscle is important in lower body movement because it stabilizes the hip joint and lifts and rotates the thigh away from the body. This enables us to walk, shift our weight from one foot to another, and maintain balance. It is also used in sports that involve lifting and rotating the thighs, in short, for almost every motion of the hip and legs. The sciatic nerve is a thick, long nerve in the body. It passes alongside or goes through the piriformis muscle and then travels down the back of the leg, eventually branching off into smaller nerves that end in the feet. Nerve compression can be caused by spasm of the piriformis muscle. Piriformis syndrome usually starts with pain and tingling or numbness in the buttocks. It can be severe and extend down the length of the sciatic nerve, called sciatica. The pain is due to the piriformis muscle compressing on the sciatic nerve, such as while sitting in a car seat or running. Pain may also be triggered while climbing stairs, applying firm direct pressure over the piriformis muscle, or by sitting for long periods of time. Most cases of sciatica, however, are not due to piriformis syndrome. Stretching may relieve some of these signs and symptoms. Sacroiliac joint dysfunction is due to a lack of excessive mobility at the sacroiliac joint. It is common during pregnancy, especially closer to labor. Signs and symptoms of SI joint dysfunction include unilateral pain or one side pain. Management may include an SI belt, which will help support the joint, rehabilitation with a focus on core exercises, injections, or possibly surgery. Protective equipment may assist in decreasing spinal conditions, including shoulder pads, neck collars, weight belts, and SI belts. Also focusing on physical conditioning, including stretching and strengthening of muscles, and teaching proper posture and skill techniques may assist in the prevention of spinal conditions. Evaluating patients for poor posture during various activities, including walking, sitting, and sleeping. In sports that involve tackling, do not allow players to spear or lead with the top of their head. When a football player tackles, they should tackle with their head up so they can read the numbers or lettering on the jersey of the player they are tackling. Also, teaching proper lifting techniques, especially when heavy weight is being utilized, can help decrease the incident of spinal conditions.